guys welcome to CMP 250 computer architecture week one in this week uh, we'll be covering introduction general introduction about the computer architecture and then we are going to talk about uh, a little bit about computer evolution and performance so the whole week two main focus uh, area will be the introduction about the basic computer architecture how was the first computer created and all those stuff and that's internal architecture and then we'll switch to the computer evolution and performance so basically idea is to present as clearly and completely as possible the nature and characteristics of modern day computer and uh, we'll see how it's a challenging task so let's talk about uh, introduction of the computer architectures basics of computer architecture and then a little bit of early designs of computer architectures so guys uh, first thing let's discuss the basics computer organization and uh, basics of the computer architecture there is a distinction is often made between the computer architecture and computer organization and uh, although it is difficult to give the precise definition for these terms a consensus exists computer architecture basically refer to those attributes of a system visible to the programmer or putting in another way those attributes that have a direct impact on the logical execution of the program whereas computer organization refers to the operational unit and interconnection that realize the architectural specification for example uh, architectural attributes will include the instruction sets the numbers of the bits used to represent various data io mechanism and technique for addressing memory organizational attributes includes uh, those hardware details transparent to programmer such as uh, control signals and interfaces So a computer is a hierarchical complex system which uh, have a different level and at each level the designer is concerned with the structure and function. Structure means the way in which components are interrelated, functions the operation of each individual component as part of the structure both the structures and functioning of a computer are in a sense simple as we can see in figure 1.1 basically this figure depicts the basic function that a computer can perform so in general there are only four function one is data processing then data storage then data movement and then in the middle is a control which is calling all the shots 
The computer of course must be able to process the data. The data may take a wide variety of forms and range of processing requirement is broad. However, we shall see that there are only a few fundamental methods or types of storage of uh, types of data processing. This figure 1.3 is the simplest possible depiction of a computer. The computer interacts in some fashion with its external environment. In general, all of its linkages to the external environment can be classified as peripheral devices or communication lines. We will have something to say about both types of the linkage. But of greater concern in this discussion or in this course is the internal structure of the computer itself, which we can see in this figure 1.4. There are four main structural components, central processing unit, CPU, main memory, and IO, and the last system interconnections. There are four main structural components as we talked in earlier slide. Central processing unit controls the operation of the computer and performs its data processing function, often simply referred to as processor. Main memory stores the data. IO moves the data between the computer and its external environment. Whereas the system interconnection some mechanism that provide for communication among CPU, main memory and I.O. A commonly example of system interconnection is by means of system bus, consisting of a number of conducting wires to which all of other components are attached. There may be one or more of each of the upper mentioned components. Traditionally, there has been just a single processor. In recent years, there has been increasing use of multiple processor in a single computer. Some design issues relating to multiple processor crop ups and are discussed later on during this course. Each of these co components will be examined in, in the next uh, weeks, coming weeks. However, for our pur purposes, the most interesting and in some ways the most complex component is the CPU. Its major structural components are control unit, which is brain of the brain, and uh, which is the one who controls the operation of the CPU as a matter of fact, and in return, hence the computer. Then there is the arithmetic logic unit, ALU, performs the computer data processing functions like addition, subtraction, different division, multiplication, and logical operation like AND, OR, which you guys must be familiar in your earlier courses, Boolean algebra. Then there are registers which provides internal storage for the CPU. And then in the last, there is a CPU internet connection and it is basically a mechanism that is provided for communication among the control unit, ALU and registers. So, in summary, in this section, what we have gone through is basic difference between the computer organization and the architecture. And we also have understood, tried to understand the different functions like data processing, data storage, data movement and control in a complex system of computer systems. And then structure of a typical computer like CPU, main memory, IO and system interconnections components. We also have taken a brief, very 
high level view of the CPU in structural component like control units and ALU. So, the second section we are going to focus on computer evolution and performance. Here we are going to talk a, a brief history of computer, how they were, uh, they have evolved over the last more than 50, 60 years, uh, more than 60 years as a matter of fact. And uh, we are also going to talk about uh, the brief history of itself um, uh, and then some of the issues relating to the performance and how they there has there usually the designers try to do create the balance between the utilization of computer resources uh, that's also we are going and give uh, you a, a brief overlook of different uh, uh, processors so let's start this journey with a little bit history of the computer there have been different generations of computers. So we'll start with the first generation, which is also known as a vacuum tube. The computer uh, which starts all this, this revolution is known as the ENIAC. ENIAC stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer Designed and Constructed at the University of Pennsylvania and was the world first general purpose electronic digital computer. The project was a response to US need during the World War II. The task of entering and altering the programs for in the case of ENIAC was extremely tedious. So there was a another idea which was pop up during this maintenance era of ENIAC was that how can we have a stored program computer and uh, this concept was basically um, it was uh, was taken forward by uh, by Vaughn Newman in 1946 and his colleagues they start started the designing of the new stored program computers which is also referred as IAS and uh, we will be talking in details on the next coming slides this figure is basically shows the structure of machine designed by Vaughn Newman and his team uh, which is also known as the IS. It's a very small machine as compared to the ENIAC. There are four main components in this machine. One is known as a main memory, which stores the both data and instructions. Then ALU, which is known as a arithmetic logical units capable of operating on binary data then there is a control unit which interprets the instruction in memory and causes them to be executed and the fourth component is input output basically through which input and output uh, were was given to this uh, this computer so the control unit can uh, act according to that The memory of IS consisted of 1000 storage location and it was called words of 40 binary bits each. Both data and instructions are stored there. Numbers are represented in binary form and in each instruction is a binary code. In this figure 2.2 illustrate that format each number is represented by a sign bit and 39 bits value so a word may also contain 2 bit 220 bits instruction with each instructions consisting of an 8 bit operation code which is also known or was referred as a op code specifying the operation to be performed and a 12 bit address designating 
one of the word in the memory number from 0 to 99. So the control unit operates the IS by fetching instructions from memory and executing them one at a time. This figure 2.3 basically reveals that both the control unit and ALU contain storage locations like which were referred to as registers. So if we uh, look at it. Uh, carefully in this figure, we will see four, uh, five different kind of register. One is known as the MBR, which is memory buffer register, contains the word to be stored in a memory or sent to the IO unit or is used to receive a word from memory or from the IO unit. So anything going inside of a memory has to be stored here first and then will be stored subsequently into a specific location or anything coming out of the memory will also come first to MBR. Then there is the MAR which is a memory address register which basically specified the address in the memory of the word to be written from or read into the MBR. So this is the pointer in the memory basically from where the word needs to be fetched or to be written. Then the next register is IR which is instruction register. This contains the 8 bit opcode according to IS structure instruction inst instruction and this 8 bits is basically the code or the set of instructions to be executed by the or uh, by that uh, control unit. I, IBR is basically an instruction buffer register. It is employed as a temporary, the right hand instruction from a word in a memory and PC is the, basically a pointer to keep track where are we on the execution of the program. So it is contained the address of the next instruction pair to be fetched from the memory. So students, I need your special attention on this slide. This is the one of the most important slide of the whole course. If you understand this slide, the later uh, understanding that even the complex architecture which we are going to discuss later on in the next weeks will become very easy for you to understand. So I need a little bit of your attention. The IS operates by repeatedly performing instruction cycle which is depicted in the form of flow chart flow uh, chart in the figure 2.4 each instruction cycle consists of two sub cycles so there are basically first half is showing you the fetch cycle the later half of the slide is showing you the execution cycle so what happened in the fetch cycle? The opcode of the next instruction is loaded into IR, which is the instruction register. And the address portion is loaded into MAR, which is at memory address register, a pointer to the memory where the next uh, where the instruction needs to be fetched from. This instruction, which is is basically he is taken from the IBR instruction buffer register and it can be obtained from memory by loading a word into the memory buffer register and then down to IBR which is instruction buffer register, IR instruction register and MAR memory address register. If you do remember the opcode in this machine is only of 8 bits. Once the opcode is in the instruction register, the execution cycle starts. So execution cycle will only start once the opcode is in the IR. The moment the execution cycle start, control circuitry, which are the uh, which are the different kind of pulses or uh, is sending interprets the opcodes 
and execute the instruction by sending out appropriate control signal to cause the data to be moved on an or an operation to be performed by the ALU according to the opcode. So in figure 2.4, we can see several example of instructions execution by the control unit. Please note that each operation requires several steps. Some of these quite elaborate. The multiplication operation required 39 sub operation for each bit position except that of a signed bit. In this table 2.1, IS computer had a total 21 instructions which are listed there. If you see it in the different instructions have been grouped together that into different categories. First category is known as the data transfer. It moves basically the data between memory and ALU register or others to ALU registers. Then we have unconditional branch. Normally the control unit execute instructions in sequence from memory and this sequence can be changed by a branch instruction which facilitates repetitive operations. Then the third category of instruction set is conditional branch. The branch can be made dependent on a condition, thus allowing decision points. The next category is arithmetic. They are the operations performed by ALU, arithmetic logical unit, logic unit. And the last, not the least, is the address modifier. This, these, uh, this category of instruction basically permits addresses to be computed in the ALU and then inserted into the instruction stored in memory. This allows the program consideration. Uh, uh, this allows a program considerable addressing flexibility. So these are the typical instructions with the symbolic uh, and, and symbolic names attached to them and we also refer to them in off codes and then the symbolic uh, uh, representation of those off codes and then there is a respective description. Table 2.2 basically illustrates different kind of computer generations. We know them as of now. Uh, and it has been has become widely acceptable to classify computer into generations based on the fundamental technology employed as we can see in this table. For example, uh, generation number one. One is from 1946 to 57 where vacuum tubes were used and typical speed of operation per second was 40,000. Uh, and then in generation number four, uh, basically the real revolution started uh, at the generation number three where we have the small and medium scale integration started. So we have those semiconductor coming into the play at that time and the speed went to 1 million per operation per second. Then later on we have a LSI coming into and, uh, in the, at the stage of the generation number 4 and, uh, and then later on generation number 6 is ultra light scale integration which is uh, uh, I mean much much greater than the uh, previous generations capacity uh, and so far and so on. So let's talk about a very important law which is known as the Moore's law. Uh, Moore was uh, basically one of the co-founder of Intel and what he observed that the number of transistors that could he put on a single chip was doubling every year and correctly predicting that this space would continue in the near future. So, so basically um, he said that after every 18 months the pace, uh, the speed will be double. That was his uh, uh, morse and it has been still very valid. 
to some extent. So just as the density of elements on memory chips has in continued to rise, so has the density of elements on the processor chips. So as the time went on, more and more elements were placed on each chip so that fewer and fewer chips were needed to construct a single computer processor. And that was the beginning of uh, basically a, break, uh, a breakthrough in this computer field. Uh, and uh, that breakthrough really happened in 1971 when Intel developed a processor 4004. The 4004 was the first chip to contain all the components of a CPU on a single chip. And so was the microprocessor was born. So major milestone in, 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 the, in the history of computers. So about the same time 16-bit processors began to be developed and however it was not until the end of 1970 that powerful general purpose 16-bit microprocessor appeared. One of these was very famous processor 8086 and it was another milestone achieved. The next step is the trend occurs in 1981 when both Bell and HP came up and developed a 32-bit single chip processor. Intel introduced its own 32-bit 8386 in 1985 as we can see in the, uh, in the table 2.6. Different techniques were invented and uh, they were basically built into con contemporary processors to, in to speed up the processing powers. Some of the techniques which were, un uh, were employed at that time and are still very much valid is one of the techniques is known as pipelining. Pipelining, with pipelining a processor can simultaneously work on multiple instructions. So the processor overlap operation by moving the data or instruction into a conceptual pipe with all stages of pipe processing simultaneously. So it's like a, uh, the effect comes as the water flows through a pipeline. When you cut off the, the water, the water doesn't stop flowing out of the pipe immediately. It takes some time. The second technique was the branch prediction and in this technique the processor looked ahead in the instruction code to be fetched from memory and predict which branch or groups of instruction are likely to be processed next. If the processor guesses right most of the time it can prefetch the correct instruction and buffer them so that the processor is kept busy. The next technique which was used was a data flow analysis and in this technique the processor analyzes which instructions are dependent on each other results or data to create an optimized schedule of instruction. So in fact instructions are scheduled to be executed when ready independent of original program order. This prevents unnecessary delays. The next uh, technique was spe speculative execution. Basically using branch prediction and data flow analysis, some processor speculatively execute instruction ahead of their actual appearance in the program execution, holding the result in temporary locations and this enabled the processor to keep its execution engine as busy as possible by executing instruction that are likely to be needed. These and other sophisticated techniques are made necessary by the sheer power of the processor. They make it possible to exploit the raw speed of the processor. While processors 
power has raced ahead of breakneck speed other critical components or of the computer have not kept up the result is a need to look for performance balance and adjusting of the organization and architecture to compensate for the mismatch among the capabilities of various components now where is the problem created by such mismatches more critical than in interface between the processor and the main memory while processor speeds have grown rapidly the speed with which data can be transferred between main memory and the processor has lagged badly so to reduce the frequency of memory access by increasing the um, in, by incorporating increasing complexity and efficient cache structure between the processor and the main memory was one of the solution so organization and the architectures were adjusted to compensate for mismatch among the capabilities of various components another area of the design focus is the handling of the ios as computer becomes faster and more capable more sophisticated applications are developed that support the use of peripheral with intensive io demands figure 2.10 in front of you gives some example of typical very peripheral devices in use on personal computer and work station these devices create tremendous data throughput demands while the current generation of processor can handle the data pump out of these devices there remain the problem getting the data move between processor and peripherals strategies have included which were employed caching and buffering scheme plus the use of higher speed intercorrection buses more elaborate structure of buses and in addition the use of multiple processor configuration can aid in satisfying io demand as designers wrestle with the challenge of balancing power processor performance with that of the main memory and other computer component the need to increase processor speed remains there are three approaches to achieving increased processor speed uh, increase hardware speed of the processor that means fundamentally doing shrinking logic gate size more gates packed and propagation time for signal reduce the second increase the size and speed of caches so dedicating part of the processor chips then the third is the changing the processor organization and architecture to increase the effective speed of instruction execution now let's talk about the embedded systems the term embedded system refers to the use of electronic and software within a product as opposed to a general purpose computer such as laptop desktop so general a uh, good example definition of embedded system will be a combination of computer hardware and a software and perhaps additional mechanical or other part designed to perform a dedicated function in many cases embedded system are part of a larger system or product as in the case of anti lock braking system in a car which is available in almost every car nowadays so embedded systems for there are number of example we can think about as it's shown in the table 2.7 in automotive uh, we have ignition system is embedded system engine control brake system in consumer electronics all of our appliances nowadays are equipped with embedded system your washing machine your dryer uh your refrigerator your microwave all are having embedded system and there are many others uh, industrial control example robotics working in the automobile painting shops and there are so many medical equipments out there in the market like infusion pumps uh, 
cardiac uh, uh, monitors, etc. In a computer system, operations performed by a processor such as fetching, instruction, decoding, performing, arithmetic, operation and so on are governed by a system clock which is a, a, a basically a lifeline of the computer system. Typically, all operation begin with the pulse of the clock. Thus, at the most fundamental level, the speed of the processor is, is dictated by the pulse frequency produced by the clock, usually measured in cycle per second or hertz. So, typically, clock signals are generated by a quad crystal, which we can see in, in this uh, a slide which generates a constant signal wave while power is applied. This wave is converted into digital voltage pulse stream that is provided in a constant flow to the processor circuitry. And uh, so, for example, a uh, 1 gigahertz processor receives 1 billion pulse per second. So, performance factors and the system attributes. Table 2.9 is basically showing a matrix in which one dimension shows the five performance factors and other dimension shows the four system attributes. And X in a cell indicate a system attributes that affect a performance factor. So, a common measure of performance for a processor is the rate at which instructions are executed, expressed as MIPS, which is also known as millions of instructions per second, or referred to a MIPS rate. When considering system performance, computer system designer look for ways to improve performance by improving into technology or change in design. Example include the use of parallel processor, the use of memory, cache hierarchy and speed up in memory access time and IO transfer rate due to technology improvement. In all of these cases, it is important to note that a speed in one aspect of the technology or the design does not result in corresponding improvement in performance. This limitation is essentially expressed by Amdahl law. Amdahl law was first proposed by Amdahl and deals with the potential speed up of a program using multiple processor compared to a single processor. Amdahl law illustrates the problem facing industry in the development of multi-core machines with an ever-growing number of cores. The software that runs on such machines must be adapted to a highly parallel execution environment to exploit the, the power of parallel processing. So guys, uh, to sum up in the second section of this week, evolution of uh, computer, computer evolution and performance. Basically, we have covered different generations of computers, how the whole thing started, this phenomena started with the vacuum, then later on the transistors, third generation uh, is known when the integrated circuit came into the picture. And then we talked about detail about the performance design issues the different uh, issues with the microprocessor speeds and then what are the things which were adaptive techniques used to improve the microprocessor speed and then the balancing performance balancing with the rest of the components the, because as the IO components are, are very slow even today. Then we also talk about the chip organization and how those, uh, those techniques could be used to organize the chip. So, uh, we can get much faster and efficient execution of the codes. Then the concepts of multi-core came into the into the picture, and then we also talk about the embedded systems. Um, 
and the performance assessments how the clock speeds and instruction per, uh, uh, per second are executed.